<laughs> so I am very excited to be moderating the session today around reimagining frameworks for religious education. Uh, we have a, an amazing host of, of folks who will be up. Uh, we, the way I'm gonna have it, we'll have uh, Barbara and Stuart will, will talk first. Uh, 15 minutes and then about seven minutes of Q&A. Barbara then has to run because as she mentioned, she's got like a once in a lifetime speaking thing at BU. So we will let her run after that. So feel free if you have questions to feel free to ask her in that seven minute period right after and then she'll probably have to, to, to leave on us <laughs> shortly after. Uh, then after that, we will have Teresa and it'll be the same format, 15 minutes and then seven minutes of Q&A. Emily, 15 minutes, seven minutes. Monique, 15 minutes, seven minutes, which will give us a good about 30 plus minutes for a large group conversation at the end to intertwine some of these really, really great papers. Um, throughout, uh, once they get start getting talking uh, in the chat, I will, um, in the chat, I'll be putting uh, the Padlet links for the announcements. Uh, there are a lot of announcements going on. Uh, we'll be saying more at the welcome reception about the announcements, but feel free to click on the Padlet link if you want to add an announcement or to see the announcements. There will also be a Padlet link for gratitude for Mary Hess, as this is her last annual meeting as our networking coordinator. I will not cry. Uh, I will, but not right now. Um, and so there will be a gratitude Padlet for anything you might want to say to her. Please feel free to put your name um, so that way she knows it's from you on the Padlet as well if you don't have your own Padlet. Um, so yeah, and then of course at the end, we'll do the feedback form. So any questions or anything before we jump in? Nope, we got a good crew. All the folks that are ready are ready. Okay, so what's gonna happen is I'm going to start with um, Barbara and Stuart. So let me introduce these two individuals to you first. Um, I'm also going to put a pin on them so that you can see them a little, a little better. So I'm gonna pin Barbara and then let me find Stuart so I can pin you. <laughs> there you go. So as I highlight them, I'm going to talk about them. So enjoy. Um, so Barbara Morgan Gardner is an associate professor of Christian history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. Her research interests focus primarily on women in religious leadership, international education, most specifically Latin America, and religious pedagogy. She is the author of the book, The Priesthood Power of Women in the Temple, Church, and Family. Barbara received her PhD in instructional psychology. Her master's degree is in educational leadership and foundations with an emphasis in international education development. She completed postdoctoral work at Harvard University in higher education administration. She serves at instit as institute director for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Boston, which included her assignments as the chaplain at both Harvard and MIT. My goodness, you're doing all the things. Uh, she continues to serve as the chaplain at large in higher education for the LDS Church. She also serves as the BYU Interfaith Outreach Council. She was born and raised in Salem, Oregon and resides in Highland, Utah. Barbara is married to Dustin Gardner and they are the parents of two children. She enjoys her wonderful family, learning, teaching, traveling, people, the great outdoors, and life. Feel free to say hi in the chat or send out emojis because that's also really helpful, any of the emojis. Um, and next we will also have Stuart Halpern. Uh, Rabbi Dr. Stuart Halpern serves as the senior advisor to the provost and deputy director of the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought at Yeshiva University, where he organizes academic and public initiatives bridging Judaism and general studies. He's the editor and co-editor of 17, I'm going to say that one more time, 17 volumes on Jewish thought, prayer, and history, including most recently, Proclaim Liberty Throughout the Land, the Hebrew Bible in the United States, and his book, Esther in America, Esther in America. Uh, his writing on the Hebrew Bible's impact on the United States has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, Tablet, Jewish Review of Books, First Things, and the Jewish Post. So as you can see, our members are amazing and our presenters are brilliant and amazing. So we look forward to your talk. I'm gonna start your 15 minute timer now. And of course, I will let you know when you have about five minutes left. Uh, so the two of you, feel free to unmute yourselves and take it away. Stu, we haven't talked yet. Should I just go first? You go first. You do your thing. All good. <laughs> okay. Um, I, oops, I have already lost you guys. Um, I'm not, okay. Wow. Can you hear me still? Yeah, okay, we can you hear you. Out. Okay, I'm so pain. sorry. I don't know what just happened there, but I, I lost you in the process already. So really quickly, just to give you some background, and I'm going to rush through this. Stu and I have been on a kind of a, a, a travel log together for the last number of years. We, I was, I've been serving on an interfaith group that has involved a lot of our Jewish friends. And in the process, I've gotten to know Stu. He came to BYU first. I've gone to Yeshiva University. He gave me the tour of a lifetime with 
um, his wonderful students and colleagues and, and everyone there. So um, I just want to give that introduction. And this is kind of where this conversation has come. We both did a presentation on education within our own faith. And uh, anyway, so we can answer more questions at the end. So basically, we're both just going to talk about education in our own background. I think one of the things that has stood out to me the most with, with Stuart and talking with him is really that focus on um, covenantal relationships within education. We don't see it completely the same way, I would say, but I think it's very strong that we both see it as covenantal and we both see it as relationship um, with the intention of helping students, um, at least with Latter-day Saints, and I would believe the same from from Stuart is helping students receive their greatest potential, understand their gifts, et cetera, et cetera, which I will let Stuart talk about that with his. Some of you may be familiar with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormons. I, I'm going to say right off the bat, I'm going to show you some, uh, just some thoughts and some slides here, but um, I, I recognize that for many, this is very strange doctrine, but it, I should say strange in that it's, it's, it's unique in some ways, but it, it really is foundational to how we understand and how we teach, uh, especially religion, but everything we teach as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. At, at this point, I'm just going to say Church of Jesus Christ to keep it shorter. Our prophet has asked us to say the, the name of the church, and so for respect for him, I try to say that, but for timing, I'm going to uh, slow down a little bit on that one. Um, this is the religious responsibility. President Russell M. Nelson is the prophet of the church. He's a PhD MD by himself. Prophets of our church, uh, leaders of our church uh, serve in a capacity of professional, a professional capacity. And then they're called um, almost out of nowhere to become a leader of the church as an apostle and they continue forward. So this is what he says regarding education in the church. He says, pursue your education as a priority of the highest order. Gain all the education you can. With us as Latter-day Saints, education is a religious responsibility. We educate our minds so that one day we can render service of worth to somebody else. So just right off the bat, the covenant relationship, we're talking, we, genu we genuinely as members of the church covenant that we will do our best to serve other people. And one of the greatest ways to do that is to become educated. So um, in that, this is the part that I was saying, I think that's common to a lot of people. But one of the realities for us is we believed that in the pre-mortal life, so life before we came to earth, we really had a, had a, had agency and everyone on the earth had that desire to become and fulfill the measure of their, their creation, which in Latter-day Saint terms would be, we had the desire and the propensity and the ability to become deity. That's what's different for a lot of people. And so that's a drive for the Latter-day Saint is to help ourselves and help other people reach their highest potential. We believe that that's eternal. That's going to take, we don't know, billions of years for all we know, but we're here to learn in that process. So again, this is a quote from a prophet that came after Joseph Smith. He says, we, we are here as a people that we may put ourselves in possession of every truth, of every virtue, of every principle of intelligence known among men together with those that God has revealed for our special guidance and apply them to our everyday life and thus educate ourselves and our children in everything that tends to exalt man. And by exalt man, we're talking divine nature, the, the ability to do so. So um, a service is a huge um, element of, of education. And we have done many studies. This is actually a Pew Research study. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But really it is that when a member of the church, the, the more education a member of the church has, the more likely they are to stay active in the church and the more likely they are to be consecrated members of the church, meaning that there'll be a high level of service. There'll be a high level of looking out and serving other people. So they will take on assignments and roles uh, in the church to serve, but also in the community. So the more active you are in the church, the more education you will have and the more likely you are to serve. So again, that covenant responsibility. I just have in this how to gain an education, there's so much more to this, but these are just some focuses. First of all, as I've already said, to recognize that if for, for members of the church, education is a sacred responsibility. Um, second is the transition to be godlike. And that's kind of what I've talked about already. In godlike meaning meekness and, and charity and love and exercising faith, et cetera. But also that study on faith, sorry, that emphasis on faith and that emphasis on study. Um, one of the one of those things that we have looked at a lot is also a lot of Old Testament prophets that have brought us here. So in a religious education setting, these are just a couple of quotes I want to share. 
One is, this is J. Reuben Clark. Um, he was a, an early apostle of our church. He says, he who invades the domain of knowledge must approach it as Moses came to the burning bush. He stands on holy ground. He would acquire things sacred. We must come to this quest of truth and all religions of human knowledge whatsoever, not only in reverence, but with a spirit of worship. Um, and then because of time, I'm just gonna skip to one point here. The covenant relationship between teacher and student, that we do feel that we have a relationship to help students receive um, all that they can, that we love them as our students, that we strengthen with them the bonds of charity, um, and that we are genuinely trying to get us not, get them not only where we are, but to get them where God is. So at BYU, I mean, at institutes of, of covenant relationships, we typically talk about the temple, the home, the church, and the school. The home being the primary place of education for, for members of the church, where parents have this, have this sincere and sacred responsibility to raise and teach their children, ask critical questions, and have students and their children ask them questions. The temple is the most sacred building that we have on the earth. We say it's only equal to the home. Uh, in the temple, we receive what we call the key of the knowledge of God uh, that gives us the opportunity and the ability to know those things that God knows. Then we have the church, which is for many of you, you may have seen a church building uh, where we go when we are taught Sunday school meetings and things of that nature. And then we have our, our campuses. So just a quick slide on this. We have campuses throughout the world, BYU being the flagship, it's 33,000 students. Then we have BYU-Idaho, which is in Idaho, it's about 20,000. We have BYU-Hawaii, about 2,000. Uh, we have Ensign College, it's, it's kind of a two-year college. Well, it's a four-year college that's helping people more with, with uh, I just forgot the word, but just excuse me for a moment. And then BYU Pathway Worldwide, which is a new, it's an online program. It is extremely inexpensive, I think $70 per credit. If you can pay it, if you can't, it's a lot lower than that. It's international, it serves over 70,000 students today. And then finally, we have seminary and institute programs where every high school student and, and college student who is interested uh, takes religion courses, typically in the morning or after school, um, in addition to their schooling that they have in uh, the public format. So finally, is just finishing off, I'm just going to give this one for BYU, which is where I teach. Um, just this statement from President Spencer W. Kimball, who was a past prophet. He says, Brigham Young University seeks to improve and sanctify itself for the sake of others, not for the praise of the world, but to serve the world better. So just kind of giving you an overview. Again, this was coming from, from a relationship that we have with Yeshiva University, and I'm just going to turn it over to Stu. It's been great. Sorry, Stu, I wish we could be with each other, but it's All been great. great working on this with you. So I'm going to mute myself and turn to you, friend. Amazing. Can you punt the, the screen share over to me? Amazing. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, okay. Here we go. Okay, so uh, we have a 3,000-year-old tradition in Judaism, so there's lots to cover in the six minutes I have left. Um, so I want to talk about three themes, celebration, conversation, and repetition. So fascinatingly enough, a very strange thing happened around three and a half years ago in MetLife Stadium, where those of you from uh, the Tri-State area know that the Jets and the Giants play. 90,000 people gathered, but they were not there to celebrate the Jets or Giants, who are frankly not worth celebrating. What they were celebrating was the completion of the daily study of Talmud. So Talmud is an oral tradition written around the eight, nine hundreds or so of the common era, uh, which is essentially a very, very long commentary on the Bible. And if you study one page of this book or this series of books, the Talmud a day, it only takes around seven and a half years. And there are many, many thousands of people that study this. So 90,000 of those folks uh, gathered in MetLife Stadium to celebrate their completion. And it was them, their spouses, men and women coming to rejoice over learning. So much uh, does Judaism celebrate daily study. Uh, by the way, uh, you'll notice that there's lots of black in the audience because a lot of the folks who studied were very serious learners who dress in black and gray. And so someone dressed as Waldo uh, just so he could be spotted amongst the crowd. So I just <laughs> wanted to throw that in there to see who was paying attention. Okay, uh, so uh, what's interesting to note is as Tara uh, Burton has written in her very excellent book that I highly recommend called Strange Rights, A New Religion for a Godless World. Uh, we're all obviously um, uh, religious people. We all have spiritual yearnings in life. 
Uh, and people find spirituality in all sorts of places. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, we find it in our text. Uh, a lot uh, lately in the Western world, folks find it, uh, their souls uplifted in uh, soul cycle or Peloton, full disclosure, I do have a Peloton. Um, but there's all sorts of ways that people um, get their religious uh, yearnings fulfilled. But what I want to focus on is, of course, the spirituality of tradition, of faith community, of covenant, which, of course, is, is lost. Uh, no offense to those who have Pelotons like myself, but in, in, in soul cycle is not uh, as deeply rooted uh, as our 3,000-year-old Jewish tradition. So I want to uh, focus in the next couple of slides on two holidays that we have that celebrate this lifelong dedication to learning beyond the, those who might study a page of Talmud a day. Uh, so there are actually two holidays in our tradition. Uh, one called Shavuot, which is uh, 49 days after the second day of Passover, and that celebrates the giving of the law. So it's an amazing holiday, which essentially has no uh, rituals in it other than, uh, like on the Sabbath, we don't perform uh, what we call work, that's turning on electrical devices, conducting business and the like. But what's fascinating about this holiday of Shavuot is a lot of folks actually stay up all night learning Jewish texts. So we pull an all-nighter, which is something that, frankly, I haven't done since my college days, and that was not yeah. to study Jewish texts. And uh, and so people try to stay up as late as possible. Uh, for those uh, like me with young kids, it's really hard to pull an all-nighter because I'm tired just all the time. But we try to stay up a little bit extra because our tradition has it that the Israelites, the night before they received uh, the Torah at Mount Sinai, actually went to sleep. And there was a disappointment saying, well, maybe if you're so excited about something, you should stay up all night in anticipation. So to uh, repent for that mistake of having gone to sleep before Moses received the tablets on Mount Sinai, a lot of folks stay up all night. Though a scholar has pointed out that this is actually a somewhat recent tradition and Judaism recent means around 500 years old uh, because coffee arose around 500 years ago, thus enabling folks to stay up longer than you normally would for those in, in their tradition who, who drink coffee. Um, so if you were to go, and I highly recommend this for those who haven't done it, so uh, in large Jewish population centers, Jerusalem and Israel or New York, on Shavuot night, you can walk the streets and see people up 2, 3, 4 a.m., uh, studying in pairs, studying with parents, studying in gran with grandparents. It's a beautiful uh, phenomenon. And as one rabbi pointed out, uh, when you're in love, i.e. when you're in love with Jewish texts, with your tradition, with your covenant, you do crazy things. So whether it's, you know, you stay up all night, if you're dating someone, you're dating your, your future spouse. So we, we stay up all night uh, learning and connecting and growing with our covenantal text, the Torah on Shavuot night. But that's not all. There's actually a second holiday called Simcha Torah, which means the joy of the Torah. And that marks the completion of weekly Bible study. So in synagogues, once a week, we read a portion of the Hebrew Bible, the uh, what's called the, the Old Testament in some traditions. So for us, uh, we divide it into weekly portions. And at the end of the uh, year, we actually have another uh, celebration called Simcha Torah. And there we celebrate. And just like at the daily page of Talmud study, the Daf Yomi cycle celebration that I started with in MetLife Stadium, right away when we finish reading the weekly Torah portion, we then start Genesis chapter one, verse one. We start again, we start the cycle again. Just like with the daily Talmud study, right away when we finish, you then commit to another seven and a half years, which is really exciting and incredible and it shows how this is a cycle, this is a review. So much so, that there's a principle that we are supposed to repeat and repeat and learn and learn the same text over and over again, because that's how we grow. And so the Talmud, that aforementioned uh, series of books, actually has the following exchange. One rabbi says to another, one who reviews his studies 100 times is not comparable to one who reviews his studies 101 times. So it's in the repetition, in the sharpening of our learning that we truly grow. So the other sage, his interlocutor says, are you telling me that do that extra time that you didn't review? The person who learned only a hundred times is not as good as to be criticized as the person who learned 101 times? And the initial sage Hillel says, yes. It is not as great to learn a hundred times if you can learn 101 times. And the word we have to uh, express our returning to text over and over again is this beautiful word called hadran. Uh, which is an Aramaic word that actually, if you look at its meaning in the Bible, which I have on screen, it actually means to beautify. So returning and beautifying something is related in our tradition. We return to our learning, we beautify our learning, and also our learning beautifies us. It enhances our spirituality 
by going over text over and over again throughout our lifetime as we grow. We actually think that learning itself is returning to something in our innate nature. So we have the idea that this part above your lip, the philtrum, is actually uh, a mark from an angel who, sh who strikes babies who have learned already in the womb their initial Torah learning, their covenantal text, and are reminded of it as they go through learning in life. So uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, a great rabbinic teacher of the 20th century who passed away a couple of years ago, mentioned that Jews became the people whose heroes were teachers, whose citadels were schools, and whose passion was studying the life of the mind. Jews are not known for building grand buildings, but rather for building grand schools. And in Yeshiva University, we celebrate men and women's learning. Uh, we have all sorts of programs bringing together Torah and general studies, including advanced programs for both women and men. And we study courses, including um, Shakespeare in the Bible, the political philosophy, political philosophy, the architecture of election, temple architecture in Judaism and Western thought, Moses in Western thought, American and Talmudic law, Judaism and democracy. What we try to do at Yeshiva University, where I work in the office of the provost, is bring our 3,000 year old tradition of learning to bear on the great issues and great themes of the West. So thank you so much for listening and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so thank you, Barbara, thank you, Stu. You all said a whole lot of things in a very short period of time. So number one, just claps for you all around. Um, I'm so excited to hear this. So at first I want to, um, again, if there's anything um, really quickly, I've started your seven minutes for a Q&A that either of you might wanna add before we open it up to any other questions. Again, reminder that Barbara is gonna have to scoot <laughs> very soon to do some amazing things. So now is a good time if you have any questions for her or Stu would be a great time if you want to, to ask any of them. Feel free to throw your hand up and I'll, I'll pin you so people can see you or post it in the chat, um, however you might wanna do it. But I'll also ask Stu and Barbara if they have anything for each other. Just Lakeisha, Stu and I have talked so much over the last little while. I think with this short period of time, if it's okay, we'll turn it back to everyone else if you have any questions. At least that's my perspective, Stu. Sure, that sounds good. I would just add, uh, because I ran out of time, I would note that our trademark of Jewish learning, which I didn't get to, is Chavruta study, which is studying in pairs. So if you walk into a study hall, it's not a quiet library where everyone says, shh. It's actually super duper loud. And so we once brought in the political commentator, George Will, to tour our Beit Midrash, our house of study. And he walked into the buzz of hundreds of study pairs yelling at each other. And he said, how does anyone get any learning done with all this noise? But that's how we get the learning done. It's through the exchange, the, through the civil discourse of folks who disagree, but respectfully with each other that the learning uh, grows in our tradition. But, you know, since, since Stu brought that up, I will say when Stu brought me to Yeshiva University and I saw that for the first time, I was... I was so intrigued and enthralled. I mean, it's a library type setting and you walk in and, and everybody is loud and yelly. I mean, you know, most libraries we're telling, even here at BYU, we're telling people, you know, just keep it down a little bit. We have some areas where everybody can talk as much as they want to, but it was a fast, fantastic and fascinating experience to be with Stu at Yeshiva and just watching each other, watching the students learn in such a, such an enthusiastic manner. So yeah, it's, it's been so fun. Thank you, thank you. Questions, comments, what do you all have? Feel free to put your hand up or unmute yourself. Anything at all, I'm, trying, I'm going through, there are like pages of us here, so I'm going through making sure. Yeah, oh, Norma. Uh, yeah. yeah. Barb, <clears throat> Barb, I really appreciate education as a sacred responsibility and the concept of enter to learn and learn to serve in a pluralistic globe at a time like this, it is so important for each faith community to enter the public world together and serve and work for peace and justice. Um, so leaving to serve means serving each other and serving in the broader world to really make a difference in a very, very difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. It, we we definitely are trying to do that. I know Stu is the same way. They're, especially with young adults today, having a purpose um, and serving being the purpose, so many want that purpose. And I think, I mean, I'll just throw this out as, uh, if, if we can, as, as educators, we're actually starting a class at BYU in the winter with, with women leadership, and we're focusing on an element of service 
and having a service opportunity where we're working with humanitarian, local, and probably international as part of that service, as part of that leadership training. So service is a, a huge element of, of the leadership as well. Thank you, Norma. Thank you. I see Cheryl has her hand up. Thank you, Lucita. Um, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Barbara and Stu, for your, um, your words this morning. It, it's the first time that I've read anything from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Barbara, and I really appreciate your sharing this information. I'm particularly curious about the process of becoming divine. Um, not uh, only because I'm writing about it <laughs> in my dissertation, but I'm just curious about the different steps or process in addition to the educational setting um, where this occurs. So if you might suggest any other um, readings or some that you've suggested where we could learn more about this, that would be great. So thank you. and. Um, you, the, the focus on repetition um, just strikes me as very contemplative, but also reminds me of um, another session we have this morning by Emily. So um, just again to both of you quickly, I won't monopolize. Thank you so much for your thoughts. I'll, I'll answer first. Um, Cheryl, in my slides, I didn't put this slide up, but you can go to... Uh, it's just the church of Jesus Christ.org. Um, that site, if you look up becoming gods or divine nature, you can actually find more, more doctrinal statements regarding that. There's also a, a book that is, um, I was just looking it up. There's a book called To Become Like God. It's by Andrew Skinner. Andrew Skinner used to be the dean of the BYU Re Religious Education Department and mm -hmm. served on the church correlation, which means he's very, he understands the doctrine. I am happy if you, you are more than welcome to email me and I'm happy to give you some more sources, especially since you're working on a book. I'd love to help you from a Latter-day Saint perspective to know more from that. I won't go into too much just because of time, of course, but happy to help and give you resources for that. Yeah, and I would just add that um, in our tradition, as you mentioned, um, repetition is key. And so we'll often go back to the same text and look at notes that we wrote at, you know, in elementary school and then in high school and college. And a lot of our community members actually spend the year just studying the Torah and the Talmud prior to college. They take a, a gap year and just revisiting these texts and growing and adding different commentaries in the margins is something that we care deeply about, including our own insights. We believe that everyone can contribute to the tradition of, of Jewish learning. And it's through that repetition that we can hopefully gain further and further layers of understanding as we get older. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so uh, Teresa, you get the last question for this, this, this part. If you have a question, please save it. We, you know, we'll have a more robust discussion at the very end. Uh, Jennifer, I see your question in the chat. I have taken a picture. I'm gonna make sure to bring it back up for our large group discussion later, okay? So I want you to know, I see you, I hear you. I will bring that question back up, okay? Um, Teresa, go for it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Barbara and Stu, for your presentation. And uh, I just wanted to ask Stu, how early do students start in Havruta pairs? I find that's a really fascinating way of, of studying. And and would, would a student growing up consistently have the same partner, or would that change? That's a, it's a great question. So I would say we they study uh, in Paris around 12 or 13 years old. Uh, we're studying Jewish texts already, and including the weekly Torah portion that I mentioned, around ages three, four, and five already. They're learning you know, what the name of the weekly Torah portion is, what are the major themes, Abraham and Sarah and Moses, fighting Pharaoh, and those kinds of larger themes. Uh, in terms of the Haruta study Paris, yeah, around, around 12 or so. Um, and often the relationships, as you can imagine, it's sort of, I mentioned dating before. Sometimes you'll walk into the Bay Midrash and you'll tell your friend, my Chavruta broke up with me, you know, because he or she wanted to learn with a different partner. Um, but you don't have the, the, the partner is not married to you. Uh, for your lifetime, you often switch. And there are, uh, during that gap year that I mentioned where folks are there for a whole year, there's actually three um, siddharm, three units of learning. And you'll have a morning seder, you'll have a morning study partner, an afternoon study partner who's someone else, and an evening study partner, usually till 10 o'clock at night. Um, so there's definitely a variety and you're not beholden to one person. 
Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, so just a reminder, we have just listened to Brilliance from Barbara and Stuart, uh, and their section was entitled A Shared Yet Distinctive Covenant Approach to Religious Educational Formation, Jews and Latter-day Saints. So thank you both for sharing not only about these experiences, but your experience and, and how you come to find it. I think that's um, always wonderful and amazing, especially when you're sharing of yourself, um, and it's always appreciated, and we don't take that lightly, right, the sharing of it. So Thank you. Uh, feel free to show them some appreciation. I know Barbara's going to have to scoot in a minute. So send her your good energy and vibes as she goes and does an amazing devotional at BYU in front of lots and lots and lots of people. So I hope and prayers that that goes well. Um, thank you all. And we'll get ready to transition to our, our next portion. So everyone, let's just take a deep breath in. Let it out. If there's something you want to hold on to, rub it in, hold on to it for a little bit. If you want to write it down, save it for later. We can come back to it. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to move on to the next part of our reimagining frameworks for religious education, which will be Teresa O'Keefe. Uh, and she will be talking about imagining belief and belonging anew, constructive developmental theory as an aid to effective formation. Dr. Teresa O'Keefe is a professor of the practice of religious education at Boston College's School of Theology and Ministry, one of my professors that I got to have. That's in parentheses. <laughs> Teresa has been teaching at Boston College for 17 years. Her focus is on youth and young adult faith and religious education. Her 20, her, excuse me, her 2018 book, Navigating Toward Adulthood, is a theology of ministry with adolescents and is wonderful. Uh, Dr. O'Keefe is an avid sailor and lives in Boston with her wife, Irene. So with that, I will start your 15 minutes and turn it over to you, Teresa, and I'll pin you as well so we can all see you a little better. Perfect. Okay, so you can see my screen. Yes, great. Okay, so thanks for um, the opportunity to share my work with you. For the last few years, I've been working on uh, constructive developmental theory, and I just want to share some things that I've been um, about. So constructive developmental theory, or CDT, is a branch of cognitive psychology that argues that humans, as they mature, can change in their capacity to make sense of their world and themselves. These changes are made possible through neurobiological changes, uh, but are also prompted and supported or not by environmental factors. The big names behind this work are Robert Keegan, Sharon Delaws Parks, James Fowler, and Marsha Baxter Magolda. And Fowler and Delaws Parks have written explicitly about faith as part of meaning making, but all of these theorists investigate how the human's worldview can expand over time. Briefly, the paper was in four parts. In the first part, I named the theory and the contributing theorists. I articulate how the theory of psychological development coheres with my own theological outlook as a Catholic Christian, and I name a few critiques of the theory. In the second part on religious living, I briefly suggest how growth and meaning making has direct impact on a person's sense of agency, their ability to use religious belief to interpret their world, and how they understand their religious affiliation. These definitions are offered in preparation for the thick descriptions in part three, where in part three, I offer rich descriptions of persons moving along the trajectory from later childhood to adolescence to younger adulthood. And in the final section, I suggest religious education initiatives and interventions that may enhance agency, interpretation, and affiliation for these three moments along the trajectory from older childhood, early adolescence, and a young adulthood. I'm not gonna cover the whole paper at this time. My focus in these few minutes is to summarize a few key ideas I'm working through, and I welcome your feedback on them. So central to this discussion is an important point in constructive developmental theory. Developmental growth implies subsuming one way of knowing within the next wider framework of meaning. In other words, as we develop, we don't forget or discard what we've known before, rather what we know gets reorganized within a wider framework. And this concept helps uh, for our discussion of religious education, for I think that CDT offers a framework for breaking down aspects of religious frameworks so we can discover how to educate more effectively to the maturing person. I illustrate this concept with a series of concentric circles and overlay it with a religious framework. I suggest that religious practices broadly include all sorts of concrete observable activities or objects, such as prayer and worship forms, moral directives, scripture and the reading of scripture, ways of interacting as a community, even creedal statements, all sorts of concrete observable things that we do and say. 
For the religious person, those practices each are filled with religious meaning, framed by values and connected by relationships. When we see the meaning, we don't lose the practices, rather the concrete practices become more than they appear. And while the inner circle of practices are the concrete observables, as we move to the next circle, we move into the invisible world of ideas, values, and relationships. But it's this invisible that makes the visible meaningful and purposeful. The meaning and value are further framed by an ideology or a worldview. And ideologies function as networks or clusters of concepts, theories, and relationships. And for religious persons, theologies or religious worldviews are the ideologies that express visions, they organize the meaning, and they prioritize the value. They determine the practices. As ideologies, they are cognitively more complex than the meaning, values, and practices associated with them. And all of these are framed by ultimate claims about its life, about life, its source, its meaning, and its purpose. I'm having trouble here with my little screen share. Uh, right. Um, for example, the Christian practice of receiving communion, it is a concrete practice. Uh, Christians eat bread, they bless it, they distribute it. Um, but the practice has meaning and value for Christians because they believe the experience is the in it, they experience in it the presence of Christ. That meaning informs how and why we break bread and eat it. And we know that communion is various, has various meanings among Christian communities, as well as among individual Christian believers. These variations reflect the theological vision of the community or of the individual. The theology holds the meaning and value of breaking bread together with other values and practices in a cohesive vision. And finally, the theological vision both speaks to, but is subject to, a claim for something ultimately believed. Now, why do I tease this out? Because for each of these practices, value and ideologies, they require different levels of cognitive complexity for individuals to recognize and use them to interpret and make sense of their world. And while all of it's connected, they require different abilities of teaching and learning. Constructive developmental theory argues that the individual, as a maturing person, develops these capacities for what they can recognize. While the older child can recognize and make sense of the concrete practice, it takes developmental growth for them to see and appreciate the practices filled with meaning and value. It takes further growth to recognize that meaning and value are embedded in and informed by a wider vision. So let me continue with my example. The seven-year-old Catholic child can participate in the practice of receiving communion. They can take bread and they can eat it, and they can learn its meaning if it is taught to them. But it is not until they are well into adolescence and have the opportunity and prompting that they begin to see the meaning of their practice for themselves. Now they're not simply repeating what has been taught to them, but they're able to interpret meaning for, in a practice for themselves and carry that meaning making throughout their lives. However, in a few years, with the right opportunity and prompting, they can learn the theological vision behind why the community practices communion. They can also learn to see how that vision for communion connects with other aspects of Christian life, like service to the poor. In fact, they can develop a strong loyalty to that vision and community and carry that vision and all it means throughout their lives. And finally, some adults, like ourselves and our graduate students, will be further encouraged to recognize that we are thinking theologically, that we're able to shape the theology of our communities, not simply take out what has been taught to us, but we can see how theology interacts with and organizes our communities, values, relationships, meanings, and practices. Each movement reflects the developmental growth in cognitive complexity. But CDT is not just about ideas. It also has deep implications for interpersonal and intrapersonal development which means that developmental growth changes how one sees one's relationships and social world and how one sees oneself. But such growth is not inevitable. The third part of the paper gives uh, rich descriptions of the older child, the adolescent, and the older adolescent or young adult. And I suggest that you read the paper if you're interested in learning more about that. So why is this important for us? If we can anticipate the developmental capacity of the learner, we can better tailor educational efforts to the learner and prompt, as appropriate, a wider framework of meaning. 
The research on disaffiliation indicate two different moments people are leaving religious communities if they have ever been part of them. The first is in early adolescence, 12, 13, 14 years old, as reflected in Monique's paper. This is when young adolescents gain the ability to ideate and identify values they care about. Qualitative interviews reveal that young adolescents may know the concrete practices of their religious communities, but they don't know what those practices mean to the community or the values they express. The meaning and the values remain invisible. Since as adolescents, they have a new level of agency, they drop participation in things that don't make sense to them. And unfortunately, the adults in their world can offer no compelling reason to stay. The second instance happens later, after they've taken on the values, relationships, and meanings of the religious community, but become disenchanted with that community. In this instance, they may leave because they think that this community is the only religious option. All communities are the same. It's this way or no way, and so they leave. I think good religious education can respond to these two critical moments by recognizing the kinds of questions and the level of meaning making that is pushing those questions at these critical moments. Not only may it re we be able to respond to the needs within our communities, we may also attract seekers from beyond our communities. The fourth part of the paper speaks to intervention and I'm gonna summarize some points. As a person matures, it remains important to continue to engage them in concrete practices of the community. In fact, you can deepen that engagement by having them do more creative and embodied things where they get to design and investigate themselves. Have them read the actual scripture in context, not just someone's interpretation, just as Stu is describing. Have them design and execute rituals. Have them plan and service opportunities. In doing so, they will excavate the meanings that they're in. And that is, is what becomes essential at this age, to spend time talking about the meaning behind the practices. What do we intend by these practices? What values are we trying to communicate through these moral injunctions? What are our hopes for the community and its members? And what are our hopes for the adolescent and their life and its value? Spending time and energy communicating what the community means by all this becomes essential. Furthermore, I strongly suggest it's a great opportunity to create space as Emily suggests in her paper, for the learner to reflect on and imagine the world they would like to see. And as Monique suggests in hers, to ask the adolescent what values they hold dear. And then how do they imagine those values would come to life in concrete practices? In this way, you're inviting them into the mind of the religious community and tradition. Occasionally, it becomes important to articulate the bigger picture for the adolescent. Why do we value these values? What is it we believe ultimately about life and its purpose? The learner at this moment may not get it fully, but the fact that the vision is important to people, important to them, will carry a lot of weight for the time being. In a very real way, you hold the vision and they look to you. Bottom line, at this age, it is important to communicate that these practices are not just arbitrarily determined, but are full of meaning and value for a community of people and the way they believe life works. And you're invited to be part of that community and tradition. It's my final slide. Some older adolescents and many young adults may need more, even fuller explanations. They may have a pretty good understanding of the values of the community, but they need to be better grounded in the tradition's vision, the community's theology. What is it we think about life ultimately? Why does that matter? What, how does it shape our lives? Seeing the big picture, the theological vision, allows the individual to engage more deeply and intentionally in the practices of the tradition. In fact, they can even take on leadership roles within the community. Alternately, they can learn to seek out a community whose vision is more life-giving if the, the one that they're found in originally isn't. Either way, they can understand the vision and be trusted to take important contributions in line with the community's vision. Let me finish by saying that according to the theorists, development does not happen unless there's a need for it and there are appropriate supports. In a world in which religious belief is less of a given, but life still demands meaning, assisting people to see the meaning and values embedded in religious traditions can help the individual make better sense of their lives, their priorities, and their relationships. And as religious educators, we can no longer presume, as generations may have done before us, that religious meaning and value is self-evident. It is not. Its value is constantly questioned, 
and to more and more people, it seems arbitrary and even divisive. If we believe religious traditions are valuable, we need to express religious life using frameworks that intentionally speak to the meaning and value and vision behind those traditions. And constructive developmental theory can be a useful tool in that endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You still have like a minute and a half to spare. Well, <laughs> well done. <laughs> well, wonderful, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so now uh, we're gonna open up this next time if there are anyone that has thoughts, questions, anything they wanna follow up on, uh, always remembering that we'll have a larger chunk of time to talk at the end. Uh, I also just wanted to make a note for Sola Io. I just wanna know, I saw your note, your, your question in the chat. I took a picture of it. I'll be sure to, to bring it back up later so that um, Stu might be able to, to address that later, okay? Uh, I see several hands. So I think I saw, Hold on, let me see. My screen is telling me whose hand whose hand it went up first. I think it was uh, Reverend Guilford's hand that went up first. So I'll let Reverend Guilford go. Um, and then Paulus, um, you can go. And I think those are the hands that I see in that order. So go for it, Reverend Guilford. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. O'Keefe. This was a really amazing and illuminating um, paper. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, first of all, how does this, um, how do you determine whether this person, uh, this young person is an older adolescent um, versus a younger adolescent, uh, adolescent versus a old, um, an older child? Like where, how do you, how do you determine those distinctions? How do I, 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 I'm using kind of, um, blurred brackets because development is particular to an individual. Uh, maturation is particular to an individual, but um, older children, I'm going to say, we're talking somebody solidly like 10 years old, and then you begin to make, begin to see changes from, because there's changes going on neurobiologically uh, that are going to begin to prompt the possibility for newness after that. Um, and so adolescence, in my mind, is a really long time frame between, you know, anything from 12, 13, again, depending on the individual, all the way up, even into and through the mid-20s. Um, and so that's a tremendously rich in, uh, time for change. So, and also this has to do with opportunity and situations, uh, what kind of prompts the person's receiving in their world, what kind of demands they're expecting, they're receiving in their world, uh, and the supports. Because the theorists all talk about the need for both um, challenge and support. And if those two are not well married, then the person's either going to be bored or frustrated one way or the other. Um, but what you see over that span of, let's say, a decade and a half, is a dramatic change in cognitive capacity that refines over time. And so at the beginning, you begin to see self-consciousness in early adolescence. And if well-prompted, self-consciousness develops into a better sense of self-awareness in the mid to late 20s. Okay. So I don't, so I try not to give exact bracketing around ages because it's so variable. Is that helpful? Yes, and just to uh, add an addendum to what you just said, or not really addendum to what you said, addendum to what I um, asked, um, this posed a particular problem for <laughs> the ways that uh, youth ministries are oftentimes situated that by the time you, uh, you turn 18, you're popped out over to young adult ministry. Um, so I, I, I think uh, I would be interested to know where we, what would be some suggestions for how... Um, uh, those who are in this work in churches um, could help to uh, facilitate this kind of like seamless transition um, more concretely. Yeah, I think one, two things I would recommend is that I think it's a two part strategy. One is to very intentionally do be doing intergenerational engagement throughout uh, because every person is going to be learning and teaching at any moment. So learning from people who are a bit more mature than they are and their peers, and also teaching those who are a little less mature and their peers. So those opportunities for generation, intergenerational engagement, I think to have them consistently happening across the, the age spectrum is extraordinarily valuable. 
And then include within that moments to be with peers. Um, because then when they're with their age peers uh, or kind of roundabout age peers, they get a chance to kind of talk out some issues. So to just take the group and make big blocks that say, okay, here's the youth group, here's the, the young adult group, they will meet in isolation. So it's a huge jump from one to the other. My, my expectation is you probably lose a lot in that jump because they don't know enough, they don't know anybody there that they trust well enough to keep that going. So I would suggest you, you work more doing lots more things with a larger group that allows the larger group to break into smaller groupings within, and then, then also have time for more age specific in smaller groupings. And help have the group actually help you determine their own needs. And they'll probably help set a pace uh, um, and a variety um, that, that has a good balance to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so we you. have about we have about a little less than two and a half minutes left. So Paulus, I see your hand up and you might be our last question just for this section. So remember, write it down so that you can remember it for later. Put it in the chat. I will take a picture and come back to it. OK, thank you for uh, this opportunity and thank you for uh, Professor Teresa to tell to us about CDT. Uh, I'm asked to question for the first informational question about uh, what do you mean with a uh, moment of equilibrium in the in your paper page two? Uh, this is inform informational question. And the second, uh, is it uh, possible that CDT can be elaborated with a uh, theory of spirituality and the theory of maybe trauma or the theory of uh, feminism? for another story. So this uh, CDT can be a large. Thank you. Okay, hold on before you disappear. Let, let me make sure you're talking about what do I mean by equilibrium in, on the second page of the paper? Um, I'm borrowing that from the theorists themselves. They'll talk about that our, that our lives are really mostly, especially at really dynamic times like adolescence, really more dynamic than static. So it's not like you jump from stage to stage, but you're kind of moving along. But there are moments when you're like, you feel like, okay, I think I got it together. And then the next month comes and you don't have it together. So there's moments of equilibrium are just a sense of feeling a bit more secure in your ability to make sense of your world. Okay. I don't think, is that helpful? All right. Um, and so I don't, I wouldn't think of them as, especially through adolescence, I wouldn't think of them as long periods of stasis. It's those long periods of stasis are more likely to happen in middle adulthood and late adulthood, but even then. The other question, Paulus, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. How does the theory cohere with other theories of spirituality um, and, and other theories like feminist theory? Well, as a feminist who's also spiritual, I think it must because I bring those things together in myself. Um, so, what I like about constructive developmental theory is how, how really rich and broad it is. And the reason I've been doing so much work with it is I recognize that uh, the, the authors that I've noted, while they offered really rich material, they're connecting it with religious life, as I understand it as a religious educator, could be better. So that for religious educators like ourselves, you could say, okay, now what do I do with this? Uh, how do I, how, how does this get any traction in my day to day? Because for most people, it's kind of like, it's too vaguely understood. Uh, and I think it has real concrete implications. So I'm aware of the time. So I want to kind of just stop there. If there are more questions later, I'll pick them up again. Wonderful. Thank you thank so you. much, uh, Teresa. And thank, thank you for your questions. Again, write them down. We will have a chance to come back to them or put it in the chat. I will take a picture and I will come back to it. No worries. Um, so we are almost at the halfway mark. So I'm going to invite you just to take a deep breath. Let it out. Ooh. Send Teresa some gratitude emojis in the chat uh, for all of her good work. Feel free to stretch if you need it. Maybe, you know, your neck is you've been sitting, you need to stand, whatever you need to do just for a minute as we're adjusting and getting ready for our next two presenters. Um, so our, as, as, you, as you continue to stretch and prepare, I'm going to uh, unpin you, Teresa. Thank you, wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to now pin you, Emily. Um, 
and I will talk about you while you are pinned so we can all see your <laughs> lovely face in front of us. So again, just reminding you, you are at the session for reimagining frameworks in religious education. Uh, and next up, we have Emily Com. Did I say that right? Please let it's me know. Cam, but that's pretty Cam. close. Nope. Thank you. It should. I should say it right. Cam. Thank you. And that wasn't close, but I appreciate you caring for me in that <laughs> There's way. There's an H in there. Nobody ever knows what to do with it. It's Emily fun. Cam. Okay. So she is an associate professor of theology at the College of St. Mary in Omaha, Nebraska, at women's a women's college with special dedication to serving first generation students, undocumented students, and single mothers. And she is going to be talking about us, um, talking to us about childlike learning, teaching adult students using Using slow pedagogy and Montessori methods. So now that we have all finished stretching, taken our deep breath, we are ready for you and I will start your 15 minutes. All right. Go ahead and share my screen and reorient a few things here. All right. Can everyone see that? Looks good. All right. So my discussion today is a very practical discussion about how I have been sorting through uh, two disparate parts of my life and two disparate parts of my pedagogical personality um, and how I used it to solve a very specific question that of course is not completely solved uh, but will hopefully be a jumping off point for a good discussion today. So that is talking about how I can teach adult students in a way that might be a bit more childlike, not childish, but childlike in hopes that they can gain more out of classes than they often do from a uh, very intense, uh, very stressful academic learning. So come on, there we go. So to give you a little bit of context about why I arrived at this question, uh, how I got here, first off, there is just my life. So I am a professor, I teach primarily undergraduates, but as Lakeisha mentioned in my uh, introduction, the school I teach at is uh, a bit mixed in terms of how traditional or non-traditional our undergraduates tend to be. So we have plenty of traditional age, but oftentimes they have significant responsibilities at home. They're doing childcare on behalf of their parents. They are translating for their parents. Quite a few of them are parents already, even though they might be traditional age. So I teach undergraduates who are presumably young adults, but many of them have been adultified um, to the point where in some respects they feel more similar to graduate students that I've taught. And on a different side of my life, I'm also the parent of two very small children. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and I don't sleep just a whole lot. But the types of education that I do, I'm thinking both on this very adult level and on this very tactile, childlike level, uh, depending on which zone of my life I'm in at the moment or when I'm working from home in both zones at once. I had spotted uh, earlier on, I had just gotten into the conversation about slow pedagogy, which some of you may have heard of. If you haven't, you may have heard of the slow professor. Uh, it's sort of a discussion about how to slow down academic life so that we can kind of reclaim that life of the mind uh, or that really deep learning that only happens when you uh, get into the right kind of space for it. And I also had prior familiarity with Montessori methods, which are usually considered quite childlike methods of how do we teach very, very young children. But really the crux of this came when with about two months notice, I needed to develop a brand new course for a spring term, uh, a fifth course for me. So I was already a little bit loaded down uh, just for majors and minors in theology. Uh, and I needed to build something from the ground up but what I knew I could not do was reproduce the exact same type of academic course that I typically do because, again, it was a fifth course on top of the 4-4 load I already teach uh, because I had these amazing students, all, again, theology majors and minors, who had um, a mature perspective or at least mature questions around theology. So I wanted something that would be a little bit more humane, but I wasn't entirely sure how to do it. So a lot of it was piecing these things together and then learning from my mistakes uh, as most learning involves. So just so we have the backstory of the major interlocutors, this is going to be a preposterously uh, broad overview of both of these. I'm sure many of you know of Maria Montessori, who was a physician who focused on developmental processes in small children to again, vastly oversimplify. Uh, she was very religiously grounded, uh, which not everyone uh, recognizes or remembers from her history. 
But when you think about Montessori style education, which is at least ubiquitous in the United States, though it might have a very different presence elsewhere, a lot of what people associate it with are sensory experience and that sort of self-directed play, uh, the imitation, the letting a kid kind of do what it is that they need to do or how it is they feel moved so that they can um, learn what it is they need to learn. More recently, there is the, again, slow teaching movement. Jamie Tom is not the first or the only person in this movement, uh, but he is the one with the catchiest title, I would say, who wrote slow teaching. He was thinking about how to teach more slowly or more deliberately, especially in sort of that adolescent period around secondary education. And he was also thinking about it from not just the student perspective, but from the professor perspective or the teacher perspective, that teaching can be extraordinarily stressful, that teaching is a high demand, um, and that trying to teach a little bit less or trying to teach a bit more deliberately can reduce some of the cost that uh, it often has on educators, which again, definitely rang true with me. So to give you just three areas that I thought both Montessori and Tom contributed to that I also found to be useful when I was teaching this different, this unique course in feminist spiritualities. So I put it down to three different areas. The first one is playtime. I mean a couple of different things by playtime. So both playtime in terms of playing with, so that very tactile sense of touching, feeling, being aware of the senses, looking around and being very uh, present in the moment. I also mean in here a bit of a playful attitude, um, not taking yourself too seriously, not taking the content too seriously, being willing to laugh, being willing to poke fun, um, being willing to try to be entirely yourself instead of just in that sort of performance uh, mode that many of us go into in academic spaces. So one of the things that both Montessori and Tom very much agreed on was if you can make your classroom more low stimulation, then you can paint on top of that more blank canvas specific things for your students to focus on. So again, I work at a university. Uh, most of our classrooms are not particularly well decorated. So that works out well for me. But this also meant that I didn't want to create extra stimulation if I didn't think it was deliberately serving what I was doing. So I did not use PowerPoints. I told mm -hmm. students that they could take notes if they wanted to, but there were no uh, types of assessment that were involved them recalling specific material that they would have had to write down. So some of them took notes and some of them didn't. Just that alone meant that their bodies were a little bit quieter, that they were able to look up more, that they were less worried about capturing specific phrases or specific content. Mm -hmm. And I put them all in a circle where they had to all look at each other. That meant that, okay, if their bodies are a little bit quieter and they're able to look up, we were able to concentrate a lot better on discussion. Now, none of these things, as you will see in all of these slides, are brand new or are amazing discoveries that I just made all by myself, but all of them have traditions behind them, and they can be a bit countercultural in this undergraduate academic space that I am in. So from that point, we tried to create sensory experiences. Some of them worked, like going to a chapel or religious space um, and thinking about bodily presence in that space and how our bodies felt in that space. Some of them did not work at all. I tried to give them all paper and said, just doodle the entire class period. That was not a success. Uh, they all got very, very concerned about what they were drawing and then had too much difficulty trying to focus between what they were drawing and what they were trying to say. And it was a great idea. It was lovely to experiment with. Uh, and it also gave us an opportunity to laugh a good bit at um, the ways that things don't always turn out the way you expect, which again feeds into the second part of it, which is trying to be lighthearted, trying to be a little bit funny, trying to uh, create a space where people feel comfortable messing around. And again, play is really the operative term here. If you think something looks like a connection or if it reminds you of something, why not just say it and we'll mess with it and we'll see if it works. And maybe it will work and maybe it won't, but better to try to make the connections, better to throw it out there than to just sit and worry that you're trying to perform for other students or for the professor. So playtime in both senses, play both in that focus that you can get, that really contemplative type of focus that I can see in my two-year-old only when he is in the bath and I really need him to be out of the bath, but also the, the sort of patience or the lightheartedness that comes from uh, just 
being gentle with one another in a space. So that is playtime. Now let's talk a little bit about story time. So again, as a parent of young children, I read the same books over and over and over and over again. And as best I can tell at this stage, I may never stop reading those books. Uh, repetition is a tremendous part of my experience with texts right now. So when I was thinking about story time and how I wanted my adult learners to, pro to approach texts, I first off wanted to help eliminate fear because there is tends to be so much tremendous anxiety around dealing with difficult texts in an academic setting, but also to promote uh, the curiosity or the enjoyment that I see when I'm reading Brown Bear, Brown Bear for the 17th time that day. So I had a few different strategies that worked out here. So one was we were specifically doing a spiritualities class. So spirituality text does tend to be a bit dense and a bit poetic and a little bit ephemeral because somebody is literally trying to put words to something that is too big to explain with words. So we ended up starting each class and starting the entire course by using poetry. And in my case, it was always the poetry of Alice Walker. But trying to get into that space where we're savoring the language and we're thinking about it rather than trying to pull one or two key takeaways uh, so that we can say them out loud and uh, show off to everyone how intelligent we are. So using the poetry prior to going into more academic texts helped for that slow down method. And it helped reaffirm that, yeah, you do need to read things a few times sometimes before they're going to make any sense. The imagery is not always going to be obvious the first time around. Uh, again, this is something suggested by Tom uh, to offer previews of reading, to give a little bit of background on everyone, again, this should be obvious to almost anyone who's been in classroom education, but it's one of those things that's very easy to skip when you feel like you're short on time. So being able to introduce my students ahead of time to what we're about to talk about, to who this person is and why this matters to them. That also was helpful in having my students make connections. Um, we primarily were focused on uh, all of our the spiritual texts we read were written by or authored by women, but we were specifically looking at uh, spirituality texts written by women of color in the U.S. context, and a majority of my students in the class were women of color in the U.S. context. So being able to make those kind of personal connections before they started reading seemed to promote that engagement and again lessen the fear a little bit because they saw a connection between the life they lived and the life that this author had also lived. <laughs> Now, the part that I was most concerned about was that I literally told my students, I'm going to assign much less than you would normally have to read in a class of this level, and you're required to read it all twice. And on the syllabus, on every course page on my Canvas site or learning management system, every single reading is listed twice. And at the bottom of every single thing was listed, make sure you come to class with your insights about what changed for you between your first reading and your second reading. I truly thought that this was going to be sort of the straw that broke the camel's back, that this was the thing where my students would check out entirely. Strangely, they were very open to it. And I feel like that's a good thing to point out that just because you're asking a student to do something that is a bit out of their uh, wheelhouse doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to reject it, especially if you can explain why. So in this case, it was saying all of this stuff is dense and you're not going to get all of it the first time through. In fact, it would be a little bit a little bit sad if you did, because these texts are meant to be savored and to be thought about and to be chewed over. So you're going to have to do it at least twice. And believe me, you're going to get something new out of it each time. One of the uh, unexpected perks of this, so I did, I pulled my students before the semester began to ask how they were feeling about this. And uh, again, it was oddly positive. Uh, but one of the things I noticed that was an advantage I did not expect was of the 12 students in the class, um, six of the seven of them, I think, were bilingual or multilingual. And while it wasn't something that I ever noticed um, in my teaching role, I know that for many of those students, they felt less confident with the English language, even if it had been a language um, that they had been speaking and using since uh, early childhood or even birth. There was often a fear of misunderstanding 
that again, to me, did not have a basis in reality, but due to their prior experiences, and especially due to racism they had experienced in their school systems, they were constantly concerned that somehow having more than one language would get in the way of them fully comprehending something in English. So being able to say, you're going to have to read it twice. That's how, that's the correct practice here. It demystified and also affirmed something that a lot of my students were already doing and confirmed it not as uh, something that a a poor student would do because they don't understand, but something that excellent students do because they want to understand better. So the last one of the series is nap time, which is a little bit of a misnomer. I did not encourage my students to actively sleep through class. It might have happened once or twice, but you can only do so much. They're very sleep deprived. So by nap time, what I mean is trying to find that deliberate space for quiet and restfulness and restoration, even while you're doing the academic work and the intellectual work of learning. So over on the right, aside from the uh, picture of the woman with silence across her mouth, all of these uh, are spaces that my students created for themselves to try to find quiet and study um, in a way that felt good for the rest of their bodies, kind of going back to that sensory idea. But one of the first things I had to learn in this class was teaching us to honor silence, which is very tricky because then you have to not only tell students that silence is a good thing, but then you have to show them it's a good thing by not breaking the silence when it happens, uh, which turned out to be more difficult for me than I expected, despite the fact that I am a more introverted learner myself. Um, uh, there's a whole story about this in the paper if you are interested in diving into that. But we had to practice and model the idea that, hey, if we don't have anything to say for a minute, we can just sit, we can relax, we can breathe, and that's okay. This is all part of that learning process. Again, my modeling had to come first in that, and um, it took a little bit of extra work, uh, more than I was expecting. And then the second part of this was again, asking students to create spaces for themselves so that when they needed to do the readings, when they needed to study, when they needed to be in, in sort of encapsulated in this space outside of the classroom space that I deliberately modeled for them, they had a place that they wanted to go to. They had a place that felt restful. Again, you can see uh, students making tea for themselves or having a cushy chair that they especially love or using a notebook that they uh, feel particularly attached to. All of those were ways to say this study space is a bit different. Uh, this is, um, oh, I just realized that I have run out of time. Very sorry about that. I only just noticed your notes, uh, Lakeisha. So uh, I will end it there. Aside from, I will just scroll forward very quickly to say that there are some considerations or challenges that I ran into along the way that I'd be happy to discuss with you if you're interested. Uh, but by and large, I found that using these more childlike methods um, was remarkably effective for adults and they were very interested in latching onto them. So, and there are also a few questions that I'd uh, be interested in discussing more if you are interested, but I will leave it at that. Apologies for uh, going over time there. No worries. I think everyone was 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 it was was in tune with you. We were here vibing with you. I mean, you know, you talk about play. I'm here for days. So we're <laughs> um all right, but I do see that number one, thank you. So snaps, all the emojis, all the great things. Thank you for um for doing this work. Um I saw a lot of similarities in what you were doing and even in some of the work that I'm doing. And I'm like, you just, I'm here for it personally. But you know, it's about everyone else, not just about me. So I know we had a question in the chat. Um, so I want to pull that up. Um uh, Sola Ayo. Uh, now, the, her question, I mean, their question is in the chat. I don't know their pronouns. I can't see them on the screen right now. Um, you're welcome to address it. But also, Sola, if you want to say it aloud, you are also welcome to ask your question aloud if you would like. Um, is that something that you would like to do? I can't, see, let me move my screen so I can maybe see the full screen. Um, if you would like to, Sola, um, you're, you're able to do that if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask it. But if not, um, maybe you can just take it from the chat. I am seeing it in the chat and uh, conveniently it was something that uh, is definitely worth talking about this question of how do you get around institutional regulations, standardized assessment patterns, grading matters. Oh, this was a challenge. Uh, it started very much with even uh, I'm one of two theology professors at my school and another the other theology professor saying I'm very concerned that students are going to look at this class and think it's easy. And that's not something we can have. So there were a few different strategies that worked. One of them was um, 
finding allies at a slightly higher level. So I have a Dean of Faculty Development who is absolutely fantastic. So when I was coming with, up with the idea, I scheduled meetings with her to talk through how I envisioned the class working and why I thought it would work and the concerns that I thought I had. Um, she was able to add uh, more to that conversation and uh, she was actually perhaps the one who suggested, you know, maybe double everything on your syllabus so that it's more obvious what you're asking your students to do. Um, okay, if your students have some self-directed reading, put that on the syllabus as well so that it's more obvious what the work actually looks like. Um, so having her on my side uh, or having her buy into the concept was a huge support when I was um, working into this. The other uh, methodology that I used in terms of grading, basically I had my students start working on their final paper immediately. Um, and the way we kept track of that was they had to be keeping weekly journals from what we were discussing in class, the type of self-directed learning, they were all uh, reading their own, um, what we call them spiritual allies on the side. They were all also reading Julian of Norwich on their own time. So they were keeping track of their learnings throughout that process in a journal format. So that helped me follow what they were doing and scaffold what they were doing at a more individual level. And it also gave me something to grade. Um, by and large, they pretty much got all the points if they turned it on time, but that is also a struggle. That's a very real difficulty for a lot of undergraduate students. Um, because the course was a little bit less structured, they sometimes had a bit of difficulty trying to figure out what I wanted. And of course, I would keep throwing the question back to them as well, what do you want to show me? What have you learned? What, what's worth sharing? Uh, which of course, just frustrated them to absolutely no end. But we did get through the semester and most of them appreciated it. Um, so it, anyway, back to the original question of how do you kind of skirt around these things? You find a few things that you can assess. Uh, that final paper, I created a good old fashioned rubric, but I also had my students look at it and tell me if they understood it and sign off and saying that they thought this was a fair assessment of what they had learned in the course. Um, and finding allies uh, among other faculty administrators really did help in me feeling confident putting forward this course, knowing that it was going to be a bit of a different vibe than other courses that I teach. Wonderful. Thank you. I see, I see Sola that was giving you some claps. So they, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Any other um, questions, thoughts um, for, for, for Emily? Feel free to you put your hands up or you can put it in the chat. Ah, I, I have one from uh, Jenny Hadid Masher. Do you want to, do you want to share it out aloud, Jenny, or do you just want to have, keep it in the chat? I, I can't find you on my screen Great. yet. I uh, guess this is an excellent point about how Montessori refers to what we think of as child's play as actual work because it is a deliberate type of work that um, Jenny, if you actually want to just say that aloud, that would be you, you can say it better than I can. Oh, well, she said she wanted to keep it in the chat. So okay, okay, sorry I about can, that. I can come on. I just can't put on video right this second because oh, no problem. things going on in my background. <laughs> um, yeah, just it's more just a caution about language just because I don't want you to run into any hardcore Montessorians that are then like, <laughs> like <laughs> I deeply um, appreciate that yeah <laughs> um just that that uh, Montessori saw that the she she basically felt like adult learning methodologies and the adult skilled environment actually interfered with kids ability to get work done in a way mm -hmm. that was developmentally appropriate for them and so all of her modifications to the environment and and her development of sensory materials was actually, she saw it as a way to enable children to work like intensely kind of in, in their own zone um, yeah. as opposed to play. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's just being careful around that word play and with a, sort of and associating it with Montessori methodology because it's not seen as play. The way that Montessori materials have now proliferated into other kinds of educational environments, they're often used like for play, but that's not actually mm -hmm. the original intention. So just just wanted to make sure it was on your radar in case yes. you you run into some zealots. <laughs> so. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and I see uh, Jennifer Sanborn has a question, and we have about two minutes of this section left. So you'll be the last comment for this section, and then we'll move on to our last one. We're almost there, y'all. Sure. So I, I really enjoyed this. And I made the assumption that this was in person teaching where you were applying much of this. And so I'm curious, as someone who does a lot of facilitation and offering learning experiences online, 
if you see virtual translations of this, certainly in people setting their own learning context, but any any advice around that would be appreciated. <laughs> I can tell you that I am also deeply curious about someone who has solved that particular question. Uh, the course, as I taught it, was considered a hybrid, um, which was reflective of the fact that we only we met slightly fewer times than you would expect for an in-person course. And then there was supposed to be a significant amount of discourse going on on students' own time uh, apart from that. Uh, I definitely have used the setting up your study space, setting up that comfortable space you want to go to in online learning contexts uh, to encourage students to make sure that they're, I have a, a wonderful colleague and mentor who refers to it as parking downhill, to set yourself up for the ability to study or to work effectively by making the space something that you want to go to, that feels nice to be. I, I tell my students frequently, like grab your best pair of fuzzy socks and get the froofiest coffee drink you can possibly find and then go try to do study because you know attending to those sensory comforts and those creature comforts make it feel like it's less of a slog uh, but in terms of the sensory experiences um, even doubling reading I think there's just extra challenges for that online where already our attention is so significantly divided so if you would like to write that paper and present it next year at REA I will be at your session I love that so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, send some love to Emily. Send some emojis. Send some things in the chat. Uh, I'm going to unpin you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we have our, our last speaker. Uh, so again, let's just take another deep breath in. Let it out. Shake it out. I don't know about you all, but you know, two hours on a screen feels like a long time. So do what you need. Do what your body needs. You know, I need my shoulders too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I am very excited because all of these papers have been so wonderful. Um, okay, so our next one, again, reminding you that you are at the Reimagining Frameworks for Religious Education session, just in case, you know, you've been coming and going. Um, and so our last speaker is Monique. And so Monique, I know you're probably going to have to correct me uh, on your name, but I'm going to give it a shot. I think it's Van Dick Rotenberg. <laughs> is that really bad or only slightly bad? I'll come back to that. No worries. Okay. <laughs> let me let me find you so I can pin you on the screen. Um, oh, where are you? I'm where in there you? twice, so you have to have my picture because I um, started it uh, again also on my phone to see whether you see my presentation. So that's the weird thing, but I'm presenting. Yeah, can, yeah so I can I can see your presentation. I can't quite see you yet, but I also I'm sure I'll, I'll try to find you once we get started and, and pin you. Um, but again, your session is you're you're going to be focusing on educating young people in their language, uh, a synodal process. Um, and you are the professor of religious education at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Um, and I'll just say Monique, because I know I can say that well and not <laughs> Uh, and not Max that one too bad. Um, so thank you. And I will now turn it over to you, Monique, and start your five minute clock. 15 minute, not five, 15 minute clock. It feels like five, of course. So because I have lectures for over an hour, as you can imagine. And after these three power women and power men, um, I'm humbled to do something at all here. But here I am. Uh, taking you uh, to a completely different part of the world and of religion as well. So yes, I'm sorry to confuse you, Lakisha. I also uh, uh, entered this uh, group through my cell phone because I was curious to find out whether I was doing all right presenting uh, all this uh, and, and seeing you. So I, I get out one way and then you can find me easier because there's only one Monique left. Monique van Dijk Groeneboer. You can practice that later. Um, in this presentation, I will shortly introduce the synodal process that's now going on in the Catholic Church. So apart from what we saw in the first presentation from uh, Barbara and Stu, we now go to a different uh, tradition. Uh, and I will introduce a small bit about that, the situation uh, in the Netherlands to be specific and the way RE is organized there. And then I will dive into the challenges of RE with uh, my research. Uh, I will uh, take you through and especially to dive into the own words of uh, youth of adolescents, help us to see the roots they have and uh, how we can help uh, religious strategies, I hope. So let's see whether it works out. 
I start with the synodal process in the Catholic Church. Uh, for those who don't know it, it started in 2021 by Pope Francis. It builds further on Vatican II and um, it's an opening up to the world from the Catholic Church, at least uh, uh, an attempt to. And it's really remarkable what's going on. I already told yesterday uh, at a meeting in our conference that I was there on the continental stage in Prague where all European countries um, uh, were together and I was one of the Dutch uh, people to attend. And that was really special to be there. And um, uh, especially women and youth are invited by the Pope to speak up in this process. And for other religion, tr religious traditions, it might sound weird because uh -huh, that's obviously the case everywhere, but it's definitely not in the Catholic Church. And um, it was wonderful for once. I won't get too deep into that for today's session. I could do an entire lecture on that, of course, but I uh, analyzed the results, for instance, in the Netherlands, when we were invited to speak up of 2,300 women participating in a digital survey on this. So that's something special never happened in the Netherlands before amongst Catholic women. And in Europe, as I said, I was in Prague and uh, also to be there amongst all the bishops and lay people were for the first time ever allowed to enter that bishops conference, which was also very special indeed for um, the, uh, uh, I, I realized I perhaps I didn't put on this camera, I, I come back to it later, sorry. Um, and um, in October, uh, now 70 women in October 2023, 70 women will also be allowed to vote in the global synod. So that's really awesome too. It never has happened before. So that's really great. And um, now I go to the situation in the Catholic Church and RE in the Netherlands, because I realizing now traveling again a week uh, in America, how different Europe is and also how different the Netherlands then specifically are. Well, being in the Netherlands, we of course think we are the world. I don't know whether that sounds familiar, but um, it, it's really amazing to realize that um, over 55% nowadays is not religious in the Netherlands at all. So uh, from the ones who are religious, only 20% is Catholic. So 20% of the entire Dutch uh, public says uh, to affiliate uh, Catholic, 14% uh, uh, Protestant, and then we have 5% Muslims and 5% different uh, religious traditions like Buddhism, uh, Judaism, uh, Jewism, and Hinduism. Sorry for the mispronunciation from those. And uh, it's also the case on Catholic, Catholic secondary schools. So mind you, a half of all schools in the Netherlands are public schools and half of them are confessional schools. And from those half of confessional secondary schools, only half is Catholic. So 25% of the entire uh, Catholic, uh, secondary schools in the Netherlands are Catholic, but we have only 20% Catholic believers, so to speak, uh, amongst the pew, pews and um, even uh, at schools, it's even worse. So for the classrooms in those secondary schools, they are staying together all the time. So every subject is for all pupils. So also the religious education is for all pupils in the classroom. And that's really amazing too, because it's never uh, that easy uh, to be providing some sort of religious education, diving into a religion, or uh, th that's really much harder than ever uh, if you don't have just Catholic children, if that was easy uh, already. So that's an extra challenge, and it's more about religions, therefore, than it is into religion, because it, you can hardly do that with that kind of population. So the challenges uh, has, have been uh, also described by the bishops recently, and they say, well, it's really become a large issue to get teachers to sign the certificate of competence, which means to obey the, the bishop, so to speak. I go over this one quickly. Uh, th there's a huge decrease in the amount of teachers who want to teach religious education nowadays. The subject, as I already mentioned, of religion is very uh, uh, difficult. Gender issues become more important and the um, Catholic uh, faith is very difficult uh, on dealing with those issues nowadays. And there's a huge change in that Catholic education. The teachers, the pupils, the boards, less and less become Catholic. So how can you be a Catholic teacher then? So now let's look into the 
uh, challenges we have in our society specifically because you know all the things that's going on in um, nowadays uh, uh, society as it, it is also in yours the covid pandemic the huge issue of the digitalization uh, there's a lot of stress in young people's lives there's a lot of lack of security especially after the pandemic and they grow up in these days and become uh, mature and as Teresa so beautifully put become adults and have those challenges and what are the practices if you are not allowed to socialize with your peers but um, you have to be there uh, uh, to grow up and become your own self and your authentic self as we often would like to say so we have a lot of a high number of depression and loneliness and this result shocked me recently uh, what i read lately that the suicide rates are rising every year in our country and among young people, it is now the number one cause of death. So one in five teenagers who die, die by suicide. And in the age of 20 to 30, even one in three. So it, it, it uh, really it beats even uh, accidents in traffic or, uh, or illnesses. So it's really a huge issue. And I, I was shocked by that. And it confirms me with how important it is to take care of these people, if we can. So for me, the challenge is look at these young people sitting in our classroom thinking, wow, um, let's stick to the box. They're not Catholic. What can I do with my Catholic religious education if that's the, your challenge? Um, but I think we should help those people to become really resilient personally as well as professionally. And how can we help them to become rooted and to grow without educating them in the old fashioned way? So open them up and not listen uh, to just bring our own picture there, but listen truly to them. And then I come to my uh, research where I want to take you with. Uh, if I'm okay with time, I think I am, that's good. Um, so the research data I want to uh, introduce here is important to know for you that um, I conduct research among uh, secondary school pupils since 1997. So every five years I conduct a quantitative study uh, survey among secondary school pupils. And in uh, last year's survey, I uh, found 1,250 secondary school pupils, of which uh, 414 came from Roman Catholic schools, 388 on Protestant schools and one public school. It's a bit random who wants to participate, who you can find uh, to uh, deal with it. So uh, sorry about that. It's not representative for those quantitative scholars who want to know that. And uh, for instance, I asked them, why do you choose a confessional school if you did? And only 1% of all pupils said it was because of the identity at the Catholic school. So the Catholic identity of school was not relevant whatsoever. So in their choosing their school, it's an interesting uh, uh, result I guess and um, do they call themselves religious uh, that's also the question very from my perspective and not from theirs but they answer it luckily for me three percent of all pupils at catholic schools mind you pronounce themselves from a catholic so here I did only the 414 catholic pupils at catholic school uh, pupils at catholic schools and of that, only 3% pronounces himself, herself, uh, themselves as Roman Catholic, 9% as Christian, 10% as Muslim, 23% as atheist, and 46% as none. So that's really something that you think, wow, this is the classroom where I'm teaching in, and what's going on here? So um, it's really uh, very difficult to... Um, uh, look at those data and also to see what can we do in uh, everyday life now. I'm curious whether I, it all works out for you well because I only see the Rhea uh, logo, but I hope I'm fine and yet you can hear me at least. Um, I asked them the goals in life, which I do every five years, of course. So also that uh, longitudinal issue is very interesting as well. And um, uh, the goals, they have a list of 23 variables where they can uh, choose and um, every uh, one of them they rank by the five point scale from very unimportant to very important you know how, the, how it works and the top three this year again uh, already many years is be happy with yourself enjoy life and be free and independent so having a life guided by God and um, 
uh, or Allah uh, or other, uh, I better finish my PowerPoint instead of uh, getting myself mixed up. The, the last three, the three that were less important uh, of all uh, 23 were having a life guided by God or Allah, trusting God or Allah, or having faith. So it's really amazing to see how it works like this and how frustrating it might be for uh, teachers standing there hoping to bring them something to, uh, to God. But that's also a, a re-assumption that we make easily, but it's better not to work on that, but really to look into that. Uh, other variables just for information were, for instance, um, uh, uh, few, uh, uh, finding it important to do something for the world, um, try to be a good person, uh, all those things. Well, I can, uh, I would like to enlarge my paper and uh, give more uh, details about that if ever, ever anyone is interested there. Then the self-description, we always want to know what do they call them themselves because we can ask them, but tick the box if you think you are religious. I am religious, 22% says, uh, agrees to that. 53% agrees with, I know exactly what I believe. And 27% uh, agrees with, I think faith is old fashioned. So um, that's interesting to know. And only, uh, so a fifth of all says they are religious, but it's also a worth thing, I think. So I come back to that later. I go to church very often, 5%. I talked to my parents about faith, 10%. I was raised religiously, 16%. And I read the Bible or the Quran, 7%. Very interesting things. And I, I can work on that much more, of course, but I have a, just a preliminary view for you nowadays. And um, now what I did above this is that I uh, selected the pupils who said to be none of that none of those uh, things. So who say, who say they're not uh, Catholic or uh, Protestant or whatsoever, they are just not non-believing. They pronounce themselves not to be religious on the second question I showed you earlier. They're not religious and they have nothing to do. They do not go to church. So there are three no's uh, uh, gathered here combined and then I selected the answers they gave on the open question and then I really get excited about the real uh, focus on this entire study and that is what do they uh, pronounce themselves as is important in this issue in this region of what this uh, survey is about that really makes your life uh, uh, what, what, what you value about it. And then we get those nuns to speak up and I want to share those quotes with you. Make your life meaningful by doing things you find important and nice. I think it is important people accept each other as they are. People get their happiness and hope from somewhere. I don't think it is important that everyone has a certain faith. People who believe do and people who do not don't. I don't mind. I think it is important that everyone is there for each other, whether it has to do with faith or with your duty as being a human. Wow, that's a 16, 17 year old, mind you. The well being of others and being in connection with those you love, in whatever way that might be. And the last quote from the sixth person that I want to show you is that you can talk to God whenever necessary. This is a pupil who says, I'm not religious, I'm not Catholic or whatsoever, I don't go to church, I have nothing to do with all that. And here we are, talk about God whenever necessary. If I only had looked through that through my own original glasses, then I would say, well, they're not religious, they're not Catholic, they're nuns. Shall we try to convert them or whatsoever? What's the worth in being here as a teacher? And um, now by deeper listening to them and using their words, we can find new ways perhaps. That's my hope. And um, like the narration uh, issue that Kayla already mentioned yesterday, it's about their narratives. Teresa also mentioned it, build on their stories, build further on it. It's really awesome to work with that. 
and um, also Emily, your deeper listening thing about um, making that quiet time, being silent and really let it sink in and read it all over and quiet it, slow teaching. It's really amazing that it, you're in the same session because I'm so happy it's getting combined all together, at least in my perspective. Uh, we can help them find their directions in life, their compass. We can add on it. We can uh, add our way of dealing with our compass and how it works. And that example helps a lot for them. But um, their rootedness and their insecurity feelings and their searching for their meaning in life helps a lot if you really allow them and really deeper listen to them. And that's exactly where this synodal process is about because it's really about listening to young people. They're not in the pews anymore. You see that from this young, beautiful young people I showed you uh, in this research, but they have so rich uh, quality, what we really would love to hear from them. When, how can we open them up and really not oppose our perspective and goals? Because I think it might be helping, helpful to them, but really listen to them because I get changed by listening to them. And that's the most important thing we are going to uh, look at and uh, we're going to work on. And it's really important also to have that outsider perspective to look at it. And it's amazing to see um, that the question to you right now also is, what's the outsider perspective as you look at this? What do you advise us in the Netherlands for religious education at Catholic schools? Do you have suggestions how to proceed and um, what, how can we work with these beautiful young people? I'm so inspired by that. And thank you for being able to share that today. Thank you. Wait, you're muted. You're muted, Lakeisha. Of course I am, right? I'm the tech person and of course I'm muted. <laughs> I feel like it had to happen at some point today. Uh, thank you so much, Monique. I was gonna say thank you, show her gratitude. I think I already saw some emojis and some things in the chat. Um, so thank you, thank you. Um, I'm starting the clock for about seven minutes. Uh, any questions specifically for Monique? And then I will open it up to the, the large group and I'll start with the questions that I took pictures of and then we'll keep going from there. But for now, any questions for uh, Monique or things that you wanna follow up on? There's a huge silence, but it's a learning science as Emily learned to us. So let's have it sink in. I'm so grateful that I see you again because I was so nervous only seeing my own presentation that it went wrong, but I thought perhaps somebody will call me on my cell phone if it is, but it, I think it went well, but perhaps you did not hear anything and that's why it's so No, we heard all the things. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was amazing. We heard all the things. I was, I was giving you some snaps, but I know you couldn't see me, so. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. No, it was wonderful. Um, so any other questions for, for Monique? I know also kind of sitting with this silence and I think sitting with the numbers can be very sombering. And I, I think really seeing where young people are, not just in theory, but actually in the numbers. I mean, even to see the, the numbers for me, I'm still gulping over here like, oof. Yes, I get that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so it was grateful to see. So anything else before we move to kind of the larger the larger conversation? Any, any other well, things? Although Again, it, uh, I, I feel the void, but uh, again, it's very impressive what you say, Lakisha, that the number of things often get uh, confusing for people. It's the same what young people have when we start talking about Bible texts or praying. They have that same weird thing about what is that person doing? What on earth is moving her? And I have the same thing with the, the English language, although I try to get myself through it, sometimes I really have to focus again, what are they saying? Because if there's a bit of accent, I don't grasp it well. And it's the same sort of feeling, I guess, that young people have when we say, well, I have a solution for you. I can give you the go in life. Let's go to church. Uh, what's, well, it's a sort of parallel learning process we are in right now. And it really moves me that it comes out of my mouth right now. So thank you for um, allowing this in this wonderful space. And let's go to the plenary then. Really awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I mean, so again, well, I'll, I'll turn it to the plenary now. And so probably around about, in about 10 minutes, I'll start letting us know we have about five minutes left and then send the feedback link. But 
We have a good amount of time. I know we took some time to breathe, so we don't have the full time that I had hoped we had, but it's okay. I think things that needed to be said, said, and we always need a stretch break. So I am very excited to have us kind of talk about all of these papers in conversation, right? So let's just do a quick recap because we have covered a lot in a very short period of time. So, you know, we started with Barbara and, and Stuart, and they're talking about a shared distinct covenant approach to religious educational formation, Jews and Latter-day Saints. Uh, then we had Teresa that came in talking about imagining belief and belonging a new constructive developmental theory as an aid to effective formation. Um, and then we had uh, Emily who came in talking about childlike learning, uh, teaching adult students using slow pedagogy and Montessori methods. And then we just heard uh, Monique who came in talking about educating young people in their language. I think it's, as she just specified their language, a synodal approach and, and what that means and really thinking about a kind of listening and hearing and really looking at those numbers. So uh, I wanna first turn to some of the photos from some of the uh, chat that questions that happened earlier that we didn't get a chance to get to, I, as I promised I would come back to. So the first was Jennifer Sanborn's question. Uh, and I think this was actually for the very first session of Stu and, um, and Barbara who I know is gone. So just gonna throw that out there again. Uh, I heard the presentations as focusing on learning of through within traditions. Is all learning similarly regarded and valued or are other domains considered lesser or not to be as prized? Um, asked in the chat based on other hands, but also um, Jennifer, if you want to reiterate that in a better way than I did, <laughs> feel free to, to restate that question um, now that maybe it might be more fresh on your mind or if you wanna add anything to it. Is it clear to you, Stu? <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it's a great question. No, I so appreciate it. We actually have in our tradition a hierarchy of learning. So we start, I mentioned earlier, our age is like three, four, five in Bible. And then uh, two or three years after that, Mishnah, which is the, the first layer of what we call oral lore, the commentary on the Bible, and then the Talmud at 12 or 13, as I mentioned. So there's definitely that uh, hierarchy. Uh, and then in terms of like general knowledge outside of our canon of, of holy Jewish texts, uh, as a modern Orthodox Jew, we believe that general knowledge enhances our appreciation of godliness, of the world, of other humans. So we believe in integrating that into what we call Torah Umada, which is a Hebrew term for Torah and general knowledge. And we believe those are mutually beneficial and we're not just living in a isolated area, tuning out uh, the best of the West, but actually specifically focus on utilizing the best of, of culture uh, to enhance our appreciation of our covenantal relationship with God and other humans. Thank you for that, Stu. And while I have you, there was another question that was from Sola. So Sola, make sure I'm, I'm saying this right. That was in the chat a while ago. Uh, she said, do study partners write exams together? And I think that was in response to you talking about them being in the library. Uh, yeah, so it's a great question. It's a great question. No, the exams are on their own. So you would have like, uh, you know, there might be a study partner who, who aces the test and the other one doesn't do so well. Um, so the study partner is really the dynamic for processing the material. It's actually a very interesting structure whereby There'll be a teacher who's in the, in the room in the study hall for around four hours, but the teacher's only lecturing for that last hour. For the first three hours, they give you a piece of paper with certain readings from the Bible, from the Talmud, from these other texts written over hundreds of years. And with your study partner, you dissect these materials, you argue about them, you debate them, you try to analyze them. You might bring in other commentaries on the commentaries as well. And the, the rabbi, the teacher is sitting there to answer any questions you might have. And then he brings it all together in this uh, longer lecture. Uh, for an hour at the end of these three hours of Chavruta study pairs. So that's how the typical structure works uh, over the course of the day. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so any other um, la large questions, any um, combination questions? I mean, I have a few over here, but again, this is not about me. <laughs> so I want to turn it over to anybody that may be on the screen that might have any questions, as well as presenters, if you all have kind of questions for each other, because there was a lots of connection between so many of these papers. I see Alfred's hand going up. Hey, Alfred, coming to us from Singapore. So it is what, not 10 p.m. your time, almost 11 p.m. So uh, good evening. Good to see you. And I hope you get some sleep soon. So go ahead. <laughs> Yes, I hope so. It's, it's, it's near 11 p.m. here. Um, great to be here. I, I'm just very much struck by Emily, your paper, when you kind of look at childlike learning. Um, but what struck me there, at least from my own work, is childlike, but there's also something we can learn from children as adults. Um, the way they learn, which has its own complexity that we have not even begun to unpack fully. You know, um, 
And, and this kind of ties me up to a question that to Teresa, I mean, for you on constructive developmental theory, I love that framework. I find it even more helpful now. Um, but I'm also having trying to consider and reconcile that set of literature with a whole real interest right now on children's agency and children's spirituality. You know, how, how, how do children actually make meaning and they need to engage with the voices of younger children today? Because I think how we're going to engage these voices as children as they are young um, in our religious education space is also going to shape the, the, the impact that would have later on as they become adults, some of whom never become adults, you know. So I'm just, just a comment and a question that, how, you know, it really, I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile that two sets of literature. I think there's a way to kind of put it together, um, but it seems to be two disparate sets at this time. Any comments? Yes, I'll, I'll take a stab. Thanks, uh, Alfred, good to see you. Um, children make meaning. The, they they don't have the yet we don't as children have the capacity to ideate as we will later um, but children will make meaning and so one of the things that I think is refreshing and this is something that we learn from children is that they will make meaning of the concrete observables without the layers of meaning that you gain later on and so there's a freshness to what they're seeing um that I think adults find themselves reminded of things that they knew before, or they, they see new insights that they did not see previously. Um, what, the, what the child is not yet able to do in the same kind of way that we'll be able to do when we're older is take on and, and internalize the meaning the community gives to something in a way that they say, okay, now I get it. I get what you're trying to talk about. I see the ideas as you're saying them and seeing them and making sense of them. And now I'm going off on my own and working within that meaning framework that my community has now offered me. So yeah, children, I mean, as humans, as people have said before me, are meaning-making beings. Um, but their capacity to make meaning, the things that they notice and take into account, their their cognitive capacity to ideate and even then to think ideationally about very complex connections of ideas changes over time if prompted appropriately. Um, but yeah, I think that children are always making meaning, but it's a different it's a different capacity than they'll have later. And it's because they don't have that older capacity yet that sometimes they're offering a fresh perspective. So I think it's not it's not either or. I don't, does that make sense, Alfred? Um, yes, it makes sense. I mean, I, I mean, in general, I mean, that, that level of complexity just changed through time and the way that children revisit what they have experienced and begin to make sense of that. Yeah. And you are right in the sense that I think children see with a fresh pair of eyes. Yeah. And in a way, it's in the relational context where the child pushes the older adult or the adolescent to make sense of what it is. Yeah. But I think in my own experience, there have also been children who have been very observant and I'm not too clear what their schema is, but sometimes the way they say things does make them come across as really wise, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and those occurrences that just strike you out of nowhere, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and for some children, it's their life world that have shaped them. So it's not so much age, yeah. but it's the life experiences that they are in that position them in places where in some way they, they need to grow up even faster. Yes. You know, yeah. so there are those cases as well. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to let Cheryl ask her question and then we'll probably uh, begin to wrap up. So Cheryl, you have the, the last question. No pressure at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lakeisha. I'll try to be quick. That'll be a miracle of grace. But I, I wonder, you know, I've, I've learned so much from everyone who's presented. So thank you. I wonder if we could freeze time and capture all of the little phases of development and exploit them so that we can learn from each one much more than we currently do. Because it, it, it sort of, 
bothers me to think that I think I'm more mature than a two-year-old. How could that be? And why might that be? Is there something about the different phases of life or are they even phases that show me glimpses of divinity that because I'm an adult, I cannot grasp. And so for someone who is two or three or autistic or uh, Asperger uh, challenged or not, you know, are there glimpses of divinity that they are able to enjoy that I cannot? And what does that mean about how they can educate and what I might be able to educate them in? Um, so I'll stop with that because it bothers me to think that I might, based on what you shared, think that I have something that can benefit the world when I'm still trying to figure out what I can learn <laughs> from the world. Um, and I just think there's so much out there that with my limited vision, I'm still struggling to grasp. So thank you all so much. Thank you for that, Cheryl. Um, any any last comments from our presenters? Uh, thank you, Stu, for putting uh, the book in the chat. Uh, also, don't forget the feedback link is in the chat for this amazing session. Give all the good feedback. <laughs> I think the session was great. Um, and so any of the presenters, uh, Monique, Teresa, I think Stu's still on here, Emily, any, any, any last words as we wrap up in the final two minutes? I think Cheryl did fine. If we don't become like children, how could we ever enter that kingdom? Something like that. I'm not a theologian, but we could work on that. So thank you for uh, adding that to this beautiful session. And thank you all for attending. It was really, really moving and awesome. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that uh, Jenny Haddad Mosher's comments is actually a great response to Cheryl. It's not that adults are better and they often get, we get distracted by the complexity we're able to see. I can truly say not so much as an academic, but as a parent that children have the gift of timelessness. They do not have any concept of the passage of time or lateness or earliness or anything that an adult would be uh, hyper aware of. It can be a true gift. It also, I, uh, I appreciate that we don't wanna valor, over valorize any one single part of life. Um, it's, it's wonderful when we can potty train ourselves also. Uh, we can learn a lot from children, but uh, I think it's it's wonderful to say we are all in community together. So we are all constantly learning from each other while we are also all teaching from each other. And I don't want to downplay that we all have something to offer. Thank you, Stu. Any final words? Thanks so much for the opportunity to learn from all of you. Really a pleasure. And hopefully we can connect in person sometime soon. Mm -hmm to it. Thank you all. Uh, an amazing session. Thank you all for your comments, questions. Feel free to follow up with these folks. You have their papers. You kind of have their contact. We're in the same organization. Let me know if you need to hunt someone down. I will help you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, only a little bit, but thank you all. Have an amazing day. There's a whole lot more. Don't forget, we have a welcome reception later, uh, the business meeting tomorrow, and so much more. Check the schedule. Uh, I'm honored to be the moderator and tech host. Have an amazing day. Take good care. Be well. Take rest breaks. Take stretch breaks. Uh, thank you for all your great work, Lakeisha. Oh, thank thank you. you so much. Couldn't, we wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Margaret, you were wonderful, Lakeisha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take care. Bye.